You might not know it, but rare earths, they run your life. We need them for LCD screens, lasers, headphones, microphones, smartphones. They're also found in space rockets and satellites, and even in some modern cancer drugs. And their use in wind turbines and electric cars means they've become a key part of developing clean energy technology, and therefore of the fight against climate change. We use them a lot, and we're only going to need more. But there's reason to worry about how we're getting them. If we don't take right steps right now, of course there will be uh, problems that we will not be able to meet the, the, the required demand in future. Restricting export of rare earth would be a good way of inflicting pain on your geopolitical rivals. Even if a mining company uh, wanted to do things in the greenest, greatest, most environmentally friendly way possible, the market incentives aren't there. In this video, we'll talk about the rare earths we need, who controls them and why, and how securing supply is a social, environmental, and geopolitical problem the world has to resolve. That's all coming up on Business Beyond. First up, the science bit. What are rare earths? Well, rare earths refer to these 17 metallic elements, many of which you've probably never heard of. Some have futuristic sounding names like neodymium or promethium. Others are barely pronounceable, like praseodymium or ytterbium. And they have certain properties that make them extremely useful. For example, they can be highly magnetic. This comes in handy when turning movement into energy. Rare earth magnets help make electric vehicle motors and wind turbines lighter and more efficient. As economies around the world strive to become more carbon neutral, the International Energy Agency predicts that demand for rare earths driven by clean energy technology will rise, more than threefold by 2040 in what they call the stated policy scenario and sevenfold in the sustainable development scenario. That's where all net zero emissions pledges are reached. In a statement, the agency's executive director, Fatih Birol, said, Today, the data shows a looming mismatch between the world's strengthened climate ambitions and the availability of critical minerals that are essential to realizing those ambitions. Now, rare earths are just one kind of critical mineral. You might have heard of others, like lithium and nickel. But having established that we need them and that we should be concerned we might not have enough, Here's one slightly confusing thing that any expert will tell you. They are not actually rare. So actually quite abundant. You can find these elements in various concentration in almost all countries of the world. So again, rare earths not rare, but everywhere. Also according to this map from the US Geological Survey. But just because rare earths can be found in a lot of places doesn't mean they're easily obtainable. The economics of mining them is not exactly straightforward. When you produce rare earths, you often produce together um, substances that are in higher demand and substances that are in lower demand, simply because they are co-located. And what this can do is that as substances which are in very high demand will lead to increase in the supply of those that are less demanded, the price of those less demanded rare earth will go down and that's going to increase the costs and lower the profits for the producers. So they will have to increase the price of the highly demanded substances. So the issue is not just the supply, but also the pricing. And it's not just about the financial cost. There's been a huge environmental price to pay because of rare earth mining. Once the ore containing the rare earths has been dug up, it will often end up in a big leaching pool, where chemicals are used to separate them out from all the other elements. But these pools can release dangerous chemicals into the air, and if they're badly sealed, chemicals can also seep into the ground, getting into the groundwater. That includes the radioactive elements that were mixed in with the rare earths. Environmentalists have made the point that in order to save the earth, you're in fact ending up destroying the earth because of the pollution emitted 
in getting these rare earths and scarce metals. There's also the dumping of the waste products from the refineries. In the Chinese city of Baotou, a vast man-made lake full of dumped toxic materials has been likened to hell on earth. This can have enormous and terrible knock-on effects for communities around these sites. Land can no longer be farmed, and drinking water has become unsafe. While we're talking about China, it's important to know how they're central to the story of rare earths and anxiety over supply. China controls by far the biggest share of the world's rare earth reserves. But there's also a high concentration of them in Vietnam. Brazil and Russia also control a substantial amount. However, when it comes to actually refining and processing, China is even further ahead. Controlling most of the global trade in rare earths gives China enormous strategic power. And that's something Beijing is fully aware of. Three decades ago, China's then leader, Deng Xiaoping, was quoted saying the Middle East has its oil, China has rare earths. This was stated in the context of a larger discussion about the vulnerability of the Middle East to uh, intervention from other Western powers because of its oil resources, and that China needed to then be watchful and prudent to make sure that the same didn't happen with respect to its rare earth reserves. Suffice to say, rare earths have become a source of geopolitical contention because of how key they are to different countries' technological ambitions and now also to their climate protection objectives. But let's take a step back. How did China come to dominate the rare earths trade? Let me take you back to 1949. One of the very first industrial projects that was prioritized by uh, the newly founded People's Republic of China uh, was actually building a vertically integrated uh, heavy industry and military industrial complex around the iron and rare earth reserves in Bayan Obo. And so with a lot of investment from the former Soviet Union, a lot of work um, over a couple of decades, uh, China built up a really robust uh, industrial foundation and also uh, sent experts all over the world to Europe, to Russia, to other parts of the world to uh, gather expertise and then to come back uh, to China and help uh, crack the puzzle of how you better refine and uh, produce alloys with rare earth elements. This was in, now we're in sort of like the 70s. And then uh, Deng Xiaoping comes along uh, and does the open up and reform and starts selectively requesting and attracting foreign direct investment in specific sectors in China. And this happened to be right around the time uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in the West removed capital controls to make it easier for uh, Western firms to look for places that had the greatest competitive advantage, uh, the lowest labor costs, um, and of course, the uh, least amount of regulatory burden. US producers went bankrupt because they couldn't survive uh, with the prices the Chinese could uh, offer. At the same time, the environmental regulation is not uh, as tough as in uh, developed countries. Over time, the market share of Chinese producers uh, rose and nobody actually noticed about that uh, for a long time because it's, it was just too convenient to get uh, the materials without uh, the environmental problems at home and at uh, low prices. And that's how China built up mastery of the sector over time and how that lake we showed you in Baotou got to be that way. But some of China's trading partners would learn the hard way that dependency from one side translates to leverage for the other. Back in 2010, technological powerhouse Japan accused its gigantic regional rival of deliberately withholding rare earth exports. The subsequent row with China saw the prices of some rare earths increase 30-fold. Obviously, it was a wake-up call to Japan. And I watched Japanese politics very closely. And I noticed that within weeks of the Chinese threatening that embargo, Japanese businessmen, you know, people who work for the big firms like Mitsubishi and Mitsui, they were turning up in places like Mongolia and Vietnam, both of which have rare earths, to explore the possibilities. So 
the rest of the world should have been alert for a longer time. More recently in 2020, concern that China would use rare earths as a bargaining chip in its ongoing trade battle with the United States saw then-President Donald Trump sign an executive order boosting funding for domestic mining. The U.S. imports almost 80% of its rare earths directly from China, and it's heavily reliant on China for the processing of the rare earths mined in America, in its one and only rare earth mine, Mountain Pass in California. And efforts on the part of, say, Europe to expand its network of suppliers is running into complications. To, to reduce dependence on China, uh, Europe went uh, to, um, to Russia. But uh, the only uh, rare earth uh, processing facility in Europe is in Estonia, and it is uh, almost completely fed by feedstock from Russia. So this is now something which uh, maybe there's a reversal. So we, we now turn to China again to uh, source uh, the material that we uh, got from Russia in the past couple of years. Um, and if China is would now uh, um, turn to a, an aggressive uh, stance with respect to supply uh, to the world markets, that would be uh, actually a big problem at the moment. An aggressive stance and disrupted supply means higher prices, and therefore inflated costs all the way down the chain and more expensive products in your hands. That would also slow down the uptake of green technology. But experts warn that the global economy being as interlinked as it is means that the race for rare earths defies characterization as a simple winner-take-all story. For the first time since 1985, in 2018, China imported more rare earths than it exported. And this is consistent with uh, the policy strategy of uh, the PRC government, which was to move out of primary resource extraction and to move into value-added processing. So now China's dominance in the rare earth and critical materials sector has to do with producing actually the technological components that contain rare earth elements and other critical materials. These technological components are then uh, exported all over the world. A lot of them are also you know, consumed within China. Uh, but then the part that I think is often left out of the picture is that China is an important destination market for finished goods from the West that contain these rare earth bearing technological components. And so our economies, our global economy is quite a bit more integrated than this West versus China or US versus China narrative would represent. The Rare Earth Industry Association says environmental regulations becoming stricter in China means their production costs are going up too. China should then have a harder time undercutting rare earth producing rivals potentially loosening their hold on the trade. Some of the latest regulations put forward in China, uh, or the environmental standards or, or regulations, that actually you can compare with that with the European standards. So if, if that standards are in place, China can no more produce and provide a material for that price that you used to get. So that price increase actually allow other companies to compete with China naturally. This might be a good moment for a recap. One, rare earths like neodymium and dysprosium, while in themselves not all that rare, are in tight supply. Two, mining them is socially, environmentally, and economically fraught. Three, the supply is still not terribly diversified. China still dominates in terms of controlling large rare earth reserves and refining capacity, even though the gap between itself and other countries in that regard might be narrowing. So here's the question. What can be done to secure the rare earths that countries need? Diversifying supply and ensuring better behavior among all actors in the rare earth space would be a start. But that's obviously not easy. A lot has to come together to achieve that. The highest social, environmental, health and safety standards, combined with a will to punish rare earth players for not meeting them, or to incentivize them so that they do. So for example, if... Um if a downstream company, if a refiner, if uh, a technological components manufacturer uh, elected to pay the premium to, um, to purchase environmentally and socially responsible uh, rare earth elements, 
then maybe they should be reimbursed, right? Um, and this reimbursement can happen and can take a number of forms of uh, already very familiar policy instruments, such as tax rebates, tax incentives, that sort of thing. Uh, and so there's nothing really profoundly revolutionary or even very novel or original uh, that needs to be applied here in order to uh, create a market that fosters this kind of greener and greater rare earth production. And then there are ways to stem demand by benefiting from what's already there without necessarily having to rush around opening as many new mines as possible. There is a lot of research going into extracting rare earths from coal ash or from tailings left after discontinued mining operations. Scientists are also looking into ways to separate elements using bacteria instead of chemicals. Then there are also programs aimed at reusing the rare earths that consumers like us just end up throwing away. So recycling is a big issue in these elements, which um, to a large extent uh, are um, uh, uh, disposed without uh, recycling uh, at the moment. And here there has been progress in the um, science to um, help, help uh, make this efficient. Although that isn't likely to help stem demand in a really significant way just yet, it's a step that more tech manufacturers are increasingly taking. Apple says its latest offering, the iPhone 13, has 98% recycled rare earth elements. Other companies are trying to reduce their dependence on rare earths full stop. German car maker BMW says it's rejigged its electric vehicle technology around a lack of rare earths. And more solutions towards either securing a rare earth supply or developing alternatives could yet still come. Some of these new technologies are very promising and there could be some technology being worked on we don't even know about yet. Technology may rescue us. Until then, however, the debate around rare earth supply continues. The most important part of which remains how to get what we need to save the planet without wrecking it any further. It's neither easy nor impossible, but it is imperative. Because um, climate change is the greatest challenge of our times, anything that would make it more difficult is very unwelcome. And it's quite actually good that we are having this conversation, thinking about ways of mitigating possible future shortages. How do we then adjust uh, the rules of our market economy to make it so that um, the bottom line isn't just a race to the bottom? I think whatever we do, it will be inadequate. And I think that's fine. I think it's better to go part of the way, to go as far as we can, than to continue business as usual. And that's all for this edition of Business Beyond. If you like this video, why not watch some of our other stuff? I'd recommend our deep dive into the global weapons trade or the battle to capture the new space economy. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.